Hey, uh, hi everybody. Uh, welcome back to Dimension Fold. It's been a minute since our last video. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been doing appearances on a lot of other shows recently. So now that that's kind of wrapping up, uh, we're getting back into our channel here. And it's a real privilege to have, to welcome back to the show, uh, Robert W. Sullivan IV. Now, Robert sent me his bio and you know what? I'm just going to paste it below. So I'll do give you the short word version verbally. He's an author and a very smart fellow. And he likes to talk about uh, weird shit like, like the rest of us do as well. So he's in good company here. Um, now, I, I think when we had been talking about doing this show, um, I was asking about um, Kabbalah stuff. But to be honest, Robert, you've got uh, the stuff that you sent me uh, is very fascinating. There's a lot of stuff in here uh, um, from your books um, about uh, your books on mo uh, movies and symbolism. And we didn't really get a chance to talk about that last time we talked. So um, maybe we should uh, delve into some of that stuff a little bit as well. Yeah, sure. What, whatever you want to talk about. I'm actually um, working on Cinema Symbolism 4 right now. Uh, along with some other projects, uh, I'm working on some some uh, some newer, updated editions of some of my earlier books, especially Royal Arch of Enoch, Cinema Symbolism One, and Cinema Symbolism Two. Uh, I just did a re re revised edition of Pack with the Devil, but no Cin Cinema Symbolism Part Four, I'm actually doing right now, and uh, that's coming along well. But it's um, taken me in, into an area that I did not expect. Um, that is is very very fascinating uh, regarding um 9 11 the kennedy assassination uh some very interesting things going on there okay interesting so so um i mean i don't want to i don't want to make you give away your your huh. your your secrets but um so you think there's uh or uh, i guess i don't know i don't know how i don't want to ask it in a way that uh that is a leading question but tell us more i guess about that connection Right. Well, the, the, way, the way this chart chapter started started was um, I, I've been on podcasts such as yours before, and inevitably one, one of the more interesting topics that people like to ask me about, I think you might have even asked me about it briefly in the last show, I can't recall, is this foreshadowing that you clearly see going on with 9-11 prior to the incident happening. Um, you know, there, there's some num numerous examples of this. Um, many of them are very startling. Um, I've talked about these ad nauseum on, on other shows. I mean, you know, movies such as Fight Club, The Matrix, uh, the, of course, The Simpsons episode, everyone knows. Um, there's some other ones that are, that are, you know, more people kind of leave off the list, like The Patriot. Um, there's some earlier ones, you know, you can go back in time, uh, of course, uh, you, you know, some of the early James Bond movies actually, you know, allude to this uh, very subtly. Um, and and then th th that was really going to be the crux of this chapter was to sort of create this laundry list of all these movies and television shows and media that had foreshadowed or somewhat, you know, prophesized 9-11. Um, when I was doing it, 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 it was interesting, but it, it didn't really quite work. Um, it was just something missing from it. Um, and so I thought, OK, well, let me expand this out a little bit. So then I started talking about some of the more conspiratorial aspects of it. And I, I didn't want to or like, you know, accounting for it. You know, is it the CIA? Is it the government? You could talk about Carl Jung. You could talk about people like Emanuel Schwettenborg. You talk about things like the collective unconscious, synchronicity. Schwettenborg called this stuff uh, um, correspondences, these interconnected things that seemingly have no relation but but are. Right. Um and then, then I, I started on that, but then still, to be honest, Ken, that really didn't get it either. So then I started delving into the astrological aspects of 9-11, and that was interesting. But then what really started kind of getting this rolling was when I started looking at the numbers with 9-11 with and some of the things that were happening numero numerologically with 9-11 with, with that was really, really strange. And then you get into it with Aleister Crowley and his takes on gematria, uh, that's astounding. I mean, that is clearly, I mean, just absolutely amazing. Um, it, when you when you study Crowley and what he was talking about and you apply it to 9-11, it's just, it's just too much. Then 
what happened after that was I, I was working on that. And then I was tipped off um, on another show I was on to take a look at this show from the early 1960s called Route 66. Um, and to be quite honest with you, Ken, um, there was about four episodes in this show um, that kind of make the 9-11 stuff look like child's play. Um, mm. And and the, 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 the show um, predicts the Kennedy assassination basically all but verbatim. I mean, all but exactly, um, I mean, right down to it. I mean, it is just astonishing. In fact, there's this one episode in particular called I'm Here to Kill a King. Um, this is Route 66. When I first started watching this show, um, this television show, it runs about 55 minutes long. Um, I was so, my, my, my initial reaction to this was, this has to be a mock-up. I mean, this, this has to be something that someone has created in the last six or seven years to try to fool somebody like me. Um, I mean, because it's that mind-blowing. And I did some research on it, and it's, it is authentic. Um, and what makes this particularly startling is, not only does this show predict the Kennedy assassination, it's about four episodes, there's overlap into this with 9-11, of all things, um, where you will clearly see references in this show to 9-11 and the Kennedy assassination. It's like everything you ever wanted. Um, and then what makes this even more creepy um, is when you start looking at the Kennedy assassination, you again find this parallel happening all over again with these Crowley numbers popping up all over the place. I mean, I, I reached a point with this where I thought I, I got to be seeing things here. Um, and, you know, I, I kind of, um, you know, was hesitant to start writing or even talking about it, but I've kind of cross-checked this um, a dozen times I mean, and it's it's legitimate. And I, I have come to the conclusion um, that this is for starters, I'm, I'm 100 percent convinced that this is beyond the realm of human comprehension. I mean, what I mean by that is this is not a man made phenomenon. I, I don't think there's people out there who could 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 work, could could do this. Um, I mean, it's it's too it's too mind boggling. Um, it could be some sort of synthesis between the two, some sort of supernatural event being aided by some sort of human force, a government force or something like that. Um, but when you, when you break it down and you start looking at this stuff, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, it's really quite, quite astounding. And it's one of these things, Ken, where um, I kind of like, like applying this to it, applying this sort of gematra to Kennedy and, and, and 9-11 um, it kind of is almost like going farther and farther down the rabbit hole. I mean, things just keep opening up. It's like you got, I mean, every, every time I start looking at this, I come up with, oh, you've got to be kidding me. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. You know, oh, yeah. you've got to be kidding me. This, this type of thing. And it's just happening. <clears throat> so, so right now, like this chapter has all but morphed into a book of its own. I'm going to still include it in the fourth cinema book, but, um, yeah, I might I might branch out and do a, do a book on this because it's just absolutely astounding. Well, that sounds amazing. Um, so, and what year was this Route sixty six? Right. Well, well, yeah. Th this is what makes this even more amazing. <clears throat> is um, there's four episodes of it, um, and and the first episode is called Black November of all things. But the one that's the really the the humdinger and all this is an episode. I'm here to kill a king, which is about. Um, the CIA basically assassinating this monarch. Um, and the episode was originally scheduled to air on November 22nd, 1963. Um, but they pulled it for the obvious reason. And um, I mean, it's, it's, it's just, um, I mean, I can give you some examples out of this. I mean, I, I'm so, okay. So wait a second. So yeah. I'm Canadian. I don't know my American history to the day. So tell us what that's like right around. Uh, no, that was the day. Year. That's the, the day, day. Kennedy was killed. Um, wow. um, and the, the episode, um, like I said, it's called, I'm here to kill a King. Um, you can watch it online for free. There are, there's, um, things in it relating to the Kennedy assassination that are astounding. There's things in it that relate to nine 11 that are amazing. Um, and believe it or not, at one point in time, um, there's a, there's a, there's a dialogue between the, um, our Arabic monarch. He says, well, I don't want to step outside the plane because there's a brand new virus going around and oh. I don't want to get sick. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's this kind of stuff. Um, and it's, it's just, like I said, when, when I watch these episodes, um, it was one of these things where right now 
I mean, I can tell you right now, after been doing this for how long as I've been doing this, these episodes make the stuff with 9-11, the movies like The Matrix, Fight Club, The Simpsons, look like absolutely like a walk through the park. I mean, they look like child's play compared to this stuff. Um, and it's just one, one of those things where it's like one thing after another after another. And, you know, you really do begin to wonder you know, I mean, what the hell is going on here? It's one thing to watch, you know, the matrix or something like that. And, you know, you kind of piece it together. Maybe this is the collective unconscious. This, this defies all rationale as to how this is happening. And right. uh, like I said, it's a, it's a, it's a TV show called route 66. It aired, it aired in, um, it aired in the early um, 1960s. Um, there's the, the, the three episodes are, um, the first one's called Black November. The second episode is called, um, I think it's called Aren't You Surprised to See Me? Um, there's a third episode called Love is a Skinny Kid. And then the fourth one is called I'm Here to Kill a King. Um, and uh, like, for example, in the one that's very unique, um, it's called Love is a Skinny Kid. Uh, it takes place in Texas and it opens with uh, a bus driving along a Texas highway and you get a picture of a road sign. Um, and it, the, the two, the two um, destinations are Dallas, Texas, and Waco. And then the, 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 the town over them is called Kilkenny, as in Kill uh-huh. Kennedy. And um, it has three next to it, as in three shots. And there's no Kilkenny, Texas. Um, it doesn't exist. It's completely fictitious. Um, and, you know, it, it's, 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 you couple that with what's going on in these other ones. And it's literally these four episodes just lay this out all on the table. Yeah. So in, in your work, you're seeing these kinds of synchronicities, I guess I'll call them. Yeah. It's in, a good word to use. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, and, and you're seeing them everywhere and, and the more you look, the more crazy they seem. And you start to wonder like, am I going crazy? Like, can this be real? Well, the, the, the thing is it's, it's the one thing is I'll say is I'm not really, you don't really see it everywhere, but when you see it, it overwhelms you. Yeah. Uh, like, like for, for, for example, um, I mean, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you a couple examples of what I'm talking about here. Um, if you read Crowley's work um, and you, you understand his gematria, one of the, one of the keys to understanding all this is Alistair Crowley talked about um, this thing and he, and he doesn't say it directly, but he's ta- he talks about, a, th- a thing called the age of Horus. Um, and this is what he wrote the book of the law about in 1904. What Crowley was ultimately prophesizing was this new age that was coming. Um, and, you know, th- this is, this is not a conspiracy or anything. It's what's called the procession of the equinoxes, the platonic year. This is the thing with a Mayan Bactun ended in 2012. Right. And it has to do with the end of, end of Pisces going to Aquarius. Crowley's Aeon of Horus is, you, that's interchangeable with the age of Aquarius. You can flip flop them out. And if you continue to read Crowley, he talks about some of the things in this new age of what to look for. Um, and if you read, read, you read him, one of the things he talks about is this new God of, of this age is the androgynine is the tra- transgendered. Um, this is sort of the new religion of this new age. I mean, he, and that, these are all but the words he uses. Yeah. Um, and, and he says in it, he said, the God of this new age is this thing called the Baphomet, which is this androgynous, um, deity that was worshiped by the Knights Templar. And, you know, everybody's seen the picture of the El Aphis Levy drawing of the goat, you know, with the one arm up and the one arm down. And if you, and in Crowley's geometric system, the number 77 is what he assigns to the goat of Mendes. He said, the goat is number 77. And essentially what he says is when you start seeing this number turning up, you keep an eye out. You know, you know, this is sort of, the, you know, when you see these events turning up and you see this number floating around with these world events, this is a herald that this new age is coming. So, I mean, if you look at 9-11, for instance, I mean, we had, you know, Flight 77 um, hit the Pentagon, um, which is 77 feet tall and sits on the 77th meridian. Uh, the the Air Force plane that was guarding um, the, the Pentagon that was flying around Washington, D.C. that day is Venus 77. And of course, the symbol for Venus is a seven pointed star. So literally 777. And if you read Crowley, he said that's the goat of Mendes on steroids is 777. Um, if you read, if you look at the Kennedy assassination, 
Um, Kennedy's license plate was GG. G is the seventh letter, 77. Uh, the triple underpass is Route 77. Um, that's where he was heading towards. And of course, okay. Route, Route 77 leads to Waco, Texas, which in 1994 was the Waco compound, which, which sat on 77 acres. You can't make this stuff up. Um, That's crazy. So, okay, so I got to say, you might not know this factoid, a little bit of trivia. Uh, I was a, I was really big into Christian heavy metal in the 80s, and Striper was, was the biggest band around. And they uh, had this, they were really into this 777 symbology. Like it was on their album covers and stuff like that. Like what? Like it's weird. I don't know. Just yeah, I mean, to look into later. Yeah, when 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 like I said, this is Crowley speaking. Um, the number mm -hmm. seven, of course, has many numinous qualities. Also, um, yeah, you know, I mean, the seven days of creation, the seven divine virtues, seven deadly sins. Um, you know, the number seven um, can have you know, uh, divine properties. But in Crowley's system, it's much more of a sinister number. And even in the world of the occult, seven, seven is a dark number. Um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's just interesting for me to see this stuff turning up, although, you know, and like I said, when you start looking at it and you kind of know what to look for now, then it really, the doors start opening. You can start seeing this stuff more and more. <clears throat> I, I am convinced more than ever that, uh, that the Kennedy assassination and nine things like that of 9 11 um, were definitely some sort of incidents that were, I don't know if you want to call them supernatural or orchestrated here on earth or a synthesis of the two, that definitely were foreshadowing this coming age of Aquarius. I, I have no doubts about that anymore because the number symbolism uh, is just, it's just too repetitive and it just, it just turns up um, over and over again. Right. Okay. So, Let's talk about mechanisms for a minute here. So, you know, you you briefly mentioned, you know, one one theory is that uh, it's people are behind it all, and they have this long uh, long ass plan about like what they're going to do in fifty years, and so you know maybe, but that seems a little far fetched. Correct. Um, it it actually seems impossible. The more the more information comes up, I agree. Um, Another theory is maybe uh, there's time travel involved. So maybe we or someone in, from the future is going back to purposefully influence things. Um, or maybe there are, like you said, maybe there's um, some kind of supernatural powers that themselves are, if they are supernatural, are probably beyond uh, our, our framework of time and space. Um, and so they could easily manipulate events without any kind of uh, worry about when in the timeline it might fall. Um, I, I'm trying to think of any other possible ex explanations. Well, my, I, I, I'm, I'm along the, I'm working along the same line you're working. When I see this stuff with these numbers repeating, what I feel like, in my opinion, and again, this is just me speaking. What I feel like I'm looking at is a computer program. I feel like mm -hmm. I'm watching. I'm, I feel like this is some sort of program, and I get the impression that there is some supernatural force, dark probably, but I'm speculating that is sort of pulling the strings on this stuff from th the world of the supernatural. <clears throat> and I believe that, or at least it seems to me, I feel like these numbers are sort of this thing's fingerprints. And what I mean right. to say is this, is that I can't prove any of this, but it's like um, it's like these numbers are like a, la a latency that's left behind for this thing that it can't it can't it can't erase. It's okay. like um, like, a, you know what I mean? Like a fingerprint that this thing yeah. is leaving behind that it, right. it can't help itself. That's right. what it feels like to me. I, I'm with you. I mean, <clears throat> I, if you want to say the Kennedy assassination was a CIA plot or something like that, um, you know, that's fine. I mean, it probably some truth to that. Um but there seems to be some sort of much darker force going on behind the scenes that I don't think people are aware of. And whatever this force is, it's leaving behind these numbers as evidence of itself. And I don't think it wants to. Right. I don't think it wants to leave these things behind. But I don't think it, I don't think it, I think that's how that's how that's its identifier. And I think right. once you start picking up on this, you can start identifying it. 
Yeah. Um, so it's like that. It's like am. that cat. Uh, it's like the cat in the Matrix, where there's the glitch kind in the of. Matrix. They didn't mean to make that cat look weird like that, but that was like a bug, I guess. And then you know it, it clues us in. Um, so yeah. to me, that that really um, is a great segue for conspiracy or not? Sorry for um, uh, simulation theory, which is mm -hmm. like you know we're living inside. A, a simulation or a video game or something to that effect like you mentioned a program um and you know that seems uh very feasible to me um i mean there's experts out there who have concluded that um just because the idea of simulation theory is an idea it somehow means that we are like that it's, it is the thing. Um, and I, I, it made sense to me when I heard it explained, I uh, unfortunately could not tell you the logic behind it off the top of my head, but I think there's a lot of, um, it's, it's sort of like not as crazy as it seems. Yeah. And, and the, 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 the thing that's so, like I said, with, with these numbers turning up is, I mean, it's 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 one of those things. It's there. I, I've been on other shows, and I may have mentioned it the last time I was here with you. It's one one of the things with with the movie symbolism that attracts me to the research and to doing it is it's concrete. Um, like for instance, you know, is it Bigfoot or is it a guy in a gorilla suit? Is it a UFO or is it the planet Venus or a helicopter? With the movie stuff, you know, I can shoot. You know, if we put on, you know, The Shining. I mean, I could sit here and point this stuff out to you. You know, there's that. There's the number, There's this. You know, there's right. that number. There's this number. Um, you know, I could do it with Black Swan or, you know, insert whatever movie you wanted. The Matrix. Yeah. I could show you all the Gnostic themes. The Wizard of Oz. I could show you all the themes. It's concrete, um, and it's the same thing with these numbers. Um, you know, you know that that number is there. I mean, I can't. You know. Uh, you know, change it. I mean, the, the number, the number exists. The number is a, a concrete, you know, you know, tangible thing. Um, yeah. it, it's not open to speculation. I mean, for example, you know, flight 93 crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. That's irrefutable. You know, flight 77 hit the Pentagon. You know, I can't change the flight numbers. Um, this is, you know, stuff that's there. It's not like, right. oh, you know, what was the flight number? Oh, I don't know. It's, it's, th that's it. Um, so, so it's, it's, I feel like with the movie, say it, this sort of runs parallel with the movie stuff. It's much more of a concrete, um, you know, you know, examination, uh, of the stuff. And that's one of the things that, that really draws me to it, but it really, it really, like I said, it, it has kind of taken on this different spin now where, um, when I start looking at this stuff, I mean, I'm now almost always, always running like a number check in my head. Um, you know, kind of like, you know, in the back of my mind. Um, because, you know, it, it's just, you know, you know, like I said, you know, a few minutes ago, it's, you know, here's this number again, you know, well, here it is again, here it is, <clears> right. here it is again, you know, wh wh why is this happening? Um, and right. it does, it does kind of feel like a, a simulation. I can't prove that. Um, I, I'm not sure that I'm 100% conven convinced of that myself. Like I said, the bet where I'm at right now is this seems to be some sort of supernatural agency at work. And these numbers are, it's fingerprints that that's where I'm at. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Well, you know, you know, I think it's wise to keep a, uh, keep our options open of course. Uh, because, you know, if we decide on an answer, then we're probably just uh, deciding which wrong answer uh, we like the best. Um, oh, I agree. But, yeah. When, when I was, um, I guess more uh, of a mainstream Christian, I had, I started writing this book um, that, it, that I was calling, um divine inception and the idea of it was that um it, i i looked at movies like the matrix and um i had probably two dozen movies in there and basically kind of looking at the themes and going well maybe the author knew this or didn't but it seems like uh i used the term at the time i was thinking in terms of god and it was like God was placing the idea into the director or the, the writer uh, into their head sure, to, sure. so that they could tell the whatever story needed to happen at the time. And it, like, you know, maybe I'm not specifically um, speaking about the details the same way now, but I think that there was like, it's basically what you're saying. 
um, in your books and you're finding all a lot of evidence that says yet yeah, there's something strange going on here. Well, what, what you're describing right now, um, this comes out of the world of, of, of hermeticism and, you know, Plato, you know, talked about creating creation, the, the act of a human, of humans creating something is a divine act. You know, it's, it's a divinely inspired act. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely. You know, is the act of creating a movie, are you tapping into some sort of force, divine or perhaps demonic, that is subconsciously influencing you? Yeah, absolutely. That's <clears throat> always got to be taken into consideration. I mean, what, one of the things you said was when, when, when I do my books, I always try to when it comes to how does this stuff get in the to movies? You know, you can always go down the path of, yeah, I mean, it's intentionally placed. I mean, I think a lot of times it is. But you can also look at it, you know, is this a case of, you know, like, you know, you get into the world of Carl Jung. I mean, is this synchronicity? Is this, you know, some sort of collective unconscious archetypal mechanism at work? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, in my opinion, you really can't settle on one answer unless you know. I mean, if you've got a, a droid filmmaker like Kubrick, I mean, all the repetition in The Shining, that's obviously intentional. Or people like Aronofsky and Black Swan or Mother. I mean, again, very, very obvious. But, you know, you can look at some other filmmakers um, and, and certainly, my goodness, when you look at these, huh, the, the, these, these Route 66 episodes, I mean, I mean, that, that stuff is just astounding. Um, and, you know, it just, it just makes you wonder, you know, how, how on earth is it getting there? Is, is it, is it, is it intentional? I mean, is it, did someone know something? I mean, is the CIA involved with this or is, you know, there's some sort of synthesis with, you know, some government agency and some extra, you know, supernatural entity, or is it, you know, or, you know, I, I, I find it hard that, I mean, I, it's, it's not a coincidence because it's just so overwhelming. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I always keep, keep my an open mind with this and you're absolutely right. I mean, when, when you examine this stuff, you always, at least I do anyway, always try to provide uh, multiple explanations for this. And I, when I do my books, I mean, I always kind of lay it out and say, you know, it's up to you, the reader to decide. I mean, you know, maybe, maybe it is Young's theory. Maybe it is divinely inspired. Maybe there is a, an occult conspiracy. Um, you know, you always have to keep an open mind to this. Yeah. Um, what, do you? So this is, a, I guess, a little bit more uh, philosophical. But um, you mentioned a couple of things that that make me have to qu have to ask this. So um, when you're talking about, you know, uh, supernatural forces uh, or whatever language we want to put on it. Um, do you think that it is more of a situation where there there may or may not be um, two opposing forces that are uh, that have to re maybe they're fighting to to regain control or they're fighting for balance or whatever it is, um, or do you think uh, more in the lines of um, there's good and there's evil and evil is just the goodness gone bad? Like, like, I don't know, there's a lot of different ways to kind kind of try to balance those kinds of ideas. Yeah, I, 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 I I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm still, um, I'm not, I'm not at that level yet where I don't know what is going on. I mean, I see these incidents and they seem pretty negative. So I'm more inclined to go with, you know, a darker force than a positive one. I, I mean, I, I definitely believe in a supreme being. I mean, I definitely believe in this whole interplay with good versus evil. Um, but I think that, um, you know, if, it, I guess, um, you know, if, if you, it, it depends on how, if you, it depends on how you want to look at this. Um, the way I, I mean, if you want to just look at it from like an astrological, you know, sort of a cult approach to this, um, if you, if you look at, you know, this changeover, I mean, let, let's assume, let's just assume for the sake of argument that Crowley is right um, and that these numbers are, and, and, and you know, and Pisces is ending and Aquarius is here. Um, you know, let's just assume that that's right. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if, if you look at the sigils and the symbols of Aquarius, I mean, it's, 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 it's very dark and it's very similar to what's happening right now. Um, I mean, you have, um, you know, really, I, I always thought that Aquarius was supposed to be this age of light and and beauty and uh... it, it 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 depends on your take on it. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where you can read it where it's supposed to be you know very democratic and e equality, but you can also um, you know Aquarius is ruled by Saturn, which is always death and melancholy. Um, that's you know you know you, and you kind of see that with this 
you know, sort of death cults going on right now with things like climate change and, um, you know, and, and again, um, uh, there's a couple others, you know, where it just seems to be this uh, obsession on, on, on death and, 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 you know, mo moderating society and things like that. So, uh, you know, it, it's, 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 you know, you, you read the literature on this. Yeah, it can be positive, but it also has a very dark side to it. Um, and if, if we are in Aquarius, and I believe we are, I think Pisces is long over with. Um, I think Pisces has been over with for at least, at least 10 years. Um, you know, you, you know, right now you're still kind of in this phase of feeling out, you know, which, which way are we going to go with this thing? And I think that's where you really see, um, you know, this, the, 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 these, these sort of opposing forces, at least in this country where, you know, you have this whole idea of, you know, I mean, you, you can see it. I mean, it's, it, it, you have, you know, the, the, the environmental, the worship of nature, um, you know, wanting to save the environment. And then you have the transgenderism. And then, you, of course, you have, you know, where, where you have like the, the, the Piscean stuff hanging on. I mean, and, and you know, this is kind of like the, 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 the Trump people, you know, where, you know, this is kind of like the, 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 the people who don't want to let go of the old age. You know, that this is sort of, you know, the reactionary crowd. Um, right. So, you know, you can kind of see this <clears throat> sort of, you know, going on right now, at least from an astrological standpoint. Um, That's really interesting because um, when I was talking to Ralph Ellis, uh, who is an, another author, historian, if you haven't, if you're not familiar with his work, you probably want to check him out. Um, but he was talking about the, this, the same type of uh, scenario that was going on between the shift from, um, from it would have been, uh, when it was moving from Aries to Taurus, or is it the other way around? No, it would have been it would have been Taurus to Aries, and then Aries to Pisces. Yeah, and and so he was saying he was showing me a bunch of stuff where in both of those places it was the same kind of thing where people were holding on and oh, didn't sure. want you know, and it was causing all this issues. Well, I was like, well, this is really this is the right. I mean, you you know, you you can see this, and this is the whole thing in the Bible with. You know, I mean, I mean, the the, Pis the Pisces religion is Christianity. You know, I mean, that's all it is, is fish and water symbolism, you know, with with uh, I mean, I, I get into that in all my books. And then you get into, you know, the, the whole thing with Aries, with Taurus going to Aries is this is Moses, you know, with the golden calf, where mm -hmm. the golden calf is the sun and Taurus, the bull. Moses is Aries, the ram. If you always look at images of Moses, he always has the ram's horns. Um, you know, and this is why he tells the Israelites to smash the golden calf. You know, you're holding on to the old age. It's the age of Taurus the bull, the Egyptian Apis bull. Um, and then, of course, you get Aries into Pisces. And, you know, it's the same sort of thing. You know, you, you know, it's the, you know, what, what's the symbol of, of, you know, of Christ? It's the fishes. Um, right. You know, Jesus wants to wash people's feet. Pisces rules the feet. Um, if you read the New Testament, I mean, that's all it is, is, is replete with uh fish and water symbolism of course yeah. you know Pi pisces is a water sign i mean and then then at the end at, at the end of it um you know and this is in this is at luke twenty two ten. this is one of the most famous you know parts in there with the zodiac where i, th I think they asked jesus you know who of course would personify the sun you know where are you going next and he says well you know i'm heading into the house of the guy who holds the pitcher of water aquarius um so you know yeah i mean it's definitely documenting the platonic year and, you know, if you read the literature, you read like Manly P. Hall, you know, they always say that, you know, the the changeover in the in the ages doesn't extinguish the old age religions or, you know, the old age hold ons. And right. I, I believe right now that's what you're seeing in this country, at least at least in the United States, um, that this 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 battle between Aquarius and Pisces, where Aquarius is the climate change, the transgenderism and the Pisces is is clearly is clearly the, the, the Trump people. Right. Interesting. Um, okay. So I want to, uh, I want to ask you about midsummer, but first um, I want to run by you an idea or uh, I guess, have you ever, have you read the book by Mike Barra? Um, and I can't remember the whole title, but it's about a conspiracy theory that implicates um, uh, um, the Kennedy assassination, the moon landing, um, like the, well, the whole NASA program and, um, how NASA was made up of three, uh, three groups of people, Freemasons, magicians, a la Crowley and, uh, Nazis. Have you read this book? 
No, but um, there's some truth to what you're saying because, I mean, clearly you had you had the rocket people, um, the scientists coming over with Operation Paperclip from the CIA. Those yeah. were all the uh, Nazi scientists that the CIA got out. I mean, at the time, it wasn't the CIA. Um, I mean, it would have been like Office of Naval Intelligence or something like that. You know, yeah. Army Intelligence. Um, you know, the CIA didn't really come into effect until after after the war. Um, then you had, of course, like the Crowley people, like with Jack Parsons, um, who is the, you know, I, I haven't read the book, but I, I kind of know, you know, where, where you're coming yeah. from with this. Yeah. You so know, I guess my question would be then fr from your, I mean, you oh, have, yeah. you have um, a really good background in sort of uh, in, in both the Freemasons and the Crowley crowd. Like, I guess what would, what would you imagine their motivations to be? um in creating nasa well i mean the, the 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 motivation would be you know you you want to explore outer space and obviously you want to land on the moon and you want you know i mean you, you know the, the further you know man goes out into space the more benefit you know the benefit more benefit you're going to have um so i mean it, it would be a beneficial thing to have nasa um you know i mean you you do i mean without question i mean you have the parsons crowd jack parsons who's the godfather of rocketry you know, which is Crowley's lead disciple here in America. Um, you have the Nazis with paperclip Werner von Braun being the main one. Yeah, I mean, then you had a lot of Freemasons who who were involved with it. I mean, a lot of the astronauts were Masons. Fred Klein Connect, who was in Baltimore, um, I think he used to run it. Um, then you know you have a lot of the Masonic stuff with with the logos and stuff with the NASA. You know, Apollo, the Sun going to the Moon, male, female. You know, yeah, the, the unification of opposites, right. um, that's very alchemical, things like that. So, yeah, I mean, you know, now I don't I don't I don't have any reason to believe that NASA, um, you know, planned to kill Kennedy. That that's a new one on me. Um, yeah, I don't think he was saying that necessarily. But yeah. Um, yeah, it's interesting because like I I see I see that it's interesting that these three groups were were, I guess, united in this mission. But it's also kind of logical because these are all smart people who are working towards the betterment of humanity and obviously exploring space is part of that betterment sure. of humanity so it does maybe it's not sinister at all <laughs> maybe it's just like yeah that's what smart people do well the the, the whole thing with with paperclip was they just wanted they didn't they didn't care i mean you have to understand the time that we were living in it was the high you know at, at that point in time in history the, the United States, it was one of two things. Okay. It was either we have, we have to get these scientists or the Soviets are going to get them. And yeah. it was basically, we do not want the Soviets to have nu nuclear weapons. They got them eventually, but we had them first. Yeah. Um, so, so, I mean, the, the motivation wasn't really the uh, call. It was, we just want to beat the Russians to it. Um, yeah. The, the, now this is true. I mean, is the guy who was the godfather of American rocketry is, you know, Marvell Parsons, a.k.a. Jack Parsons. Now, he was into some strange stuff. I mean, he was, you know, kind of like the American leader of the OTO. Um, he was doing this thing called the Babylon working. Um, I mean, he called himself the Antichrist. And again, this this ties into what Crowley was talking about with his polemic religion was that the Babylon working is the male personifies this thing called chaos. The woman is Babylon and they perform this sex magic ritual to, to create this child, um, you know, which is, you know, the, you know, Baphomet, which is this perfected, you know, child that's going to, you know, overthrow, you know, the, the, the old religions and, and set up this new religion of Thelema. Um, I mean, and that was true. I mean, and the guy who, you know, you probably know this, I'm preaching to the choir, the guy who was helping Parsons with this was no one other than L. Ron Hubbard, of all people, um, who, of course, went on to found Scientology. Mm -hmm. um, the woman, the woman that he was using was Marley Cameron. Um, she, she, she was into all this stuff. Um, and then, you know, again with with NASA, yeah, I mean, you had a lot of a, a lot of Freemasonic, uh, you know, people involved with it. I, I get into uh, a lot of that in 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 in, in the Royal Arch book that I wrote. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, I mean, I, there's, I mean, that's what you could call kind of a conspiracy fact. I've, I've never had any reason to believe, though, that NASA had any any problem with John F. Kennedy. I mean, that was more of uh, the military industrial complex, the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, Kennedy was 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 soft on, you know, they, they didn't like his policies towards communism, Vietnam. Yeah, you know, yeah that's you exactly. They, yeah. That's what the book is is more about, is that the, the Cold War 
uh, tie-ins and how things kind of went sour with that. But um, okay, so let's talk about. Um, so you sent me a, a bunch of uh, really cool um, looking stuff about various movies, uh, many of which I have seen but don't really remember. And so I'm I'm trying to go with a couple that uh, that are movies that are more familiar uh, to my memory. And I, so I would like to talk about Midsummer and uh, Donnie Darko. Yeah, sure. Um, well, Donnie Darko is is the, the these these move Donnie Darko is um, a movie that I analyzed in Cinema Symbolism three in a chapter called Gnostic Hollywood. Um, this is a very a very Gnostic movie. I love Donnie Darko. I think it's a fantastic movie. Um, just for the people out there listening to the audience, if you haven't if you've never seen the movie and you get a chance to watch it, watch the director's cut. Um, the director's cut makes is much more easier to follow than the um, than the the, the the original theatrical version, which can be very confusing. Um, it's about time travel, um, but it's it's an, it has it with a tangent universe. Um, make a long story short donnie darko is um uh, like a valentinian christ who sacrifices himself uh to, to to save his mother and and his younger sister um it's a very good movie it's a movie that is one of those ones that um foreshadows 9 11. the movie came out um right either right after it or right before it but it was made before it um and it's the scene and, and actually richard kelly who was the director of it said that this scene this scene um they left it in the movie, but he thought it hurt the movie because it really wasn't a big box office success. Um, it's, of course, gone on to become a cult classic. But there's a scene in it where a uh, jet engine um, falls through the protagonist, Donnie Darko, um, bedroom and crashes through an American flag. And, I mean, there was clear 9-11 imagery in that. And, the, like I said, the movie was filmed beforehand. And Kelly actually blamed that scene on the movie underperforming. He thought it creeped too many people out. Um, he was urged to take it out of the movie. He, I don't think he did. I know it's in the director's cut. Um, so again, that that Donnie Darko is a movie um, that you know is one of those ones. You know, we talk about a laundry list of movies that foreshadow 9/11. That's one of them. Uh, but again, that's a very Gnostic movie. Um, I I very much like <laughs> Donnie Darko. But the thing the thing about that too is like the whole plot is based based around uh, like this passage of knowledge through backwards in time, like. And it, and it doesn't even really come full circle until after the second movie, S. Darko, which is about Donnie's sister. And then you get to see they really tie up a lot of these loose ends about who is Frank and like all this crazy stuff. And it's like, man, I like I just want to watch both of those movies back to back over and over again. I, I've never I've never seen the sequel. But the, the one thing that was happening in the first one was that Donnie had done this before you know th yeah. this was like this was like his third attempt at trying to get the universe set back onto the tangent universe and if you pay attention to the movie very closely there's evidence in there that he has done that, that, that he's done this all before um one of the one of the clues was towards the end when he's bicycling over to the old woman's house if you remember when donnie's bicycling he, he's the only one of the group of his friends he doesn't have the headlight on and the, the reason for that was that he had, he had already made the trip before. He knew where he was going. This was like the third or fourth time that he, that, oh, that yeah. he had done it. So the whole thing with Donnie Darko was that this is a, this had ha he had done this like four or five other times and had failed. That's why he kept waking up, you know, you know on the bicycle out in the middle of nowhere. Right. Until, right. until he, he had to do this until he got it right. And the movie that you're watching is like the fourth or fifth try of him finally getting it right. I thought that I thought that was very very well done. Um, I haven't seen this the the S Darko movie. I know a little bit about it, but I've never seen it. But um, yeah, I mean I mean Donnie Darko is a great. It's a very good movie, very thinking man's movie. But again, to the audience, um, it, by all means, if you've never seen it and you, and you want to watch it, get the director's cut. It's a better it's a better movie. It's more explanatory, and uh, like I said, it'll be easier to follow because it includes pages from the book, the time travel book that the old woman wrote. Um, and that makes um, it a little more under to understand. Okay. I, I've never seen the director's cut. Oh, watch that. Watch in the that. normal, in the normal cut, you do see the, the aircraft engine uh, come through the ceiling. So, okay. Okay. Uh, but yeah. I, I couldn't remember that. <clears throat> it's in um, the director's cut, but um, like I said, if, 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 if you, if you watch the theatrical cut, 
and you have trouble understanding it, the director's cut will help you better understand it. Yeah. Although sometimes I really enjoy the fact that I don't know what the hell is going on uh, in those kind of movies because it's almost like that's kind of the point, right? Yeah, that's true. I I, have both, I actually have both of them here. I actually have the yeah. theatrical cut and the director's cut. So I'll have to figure out how to watch that director's cut. That sounds cool. Oh, and Midsommar, great film. Um, I mean, this is one. I haven't seen Ari Aster's new movie, but... Um, Hereditary and Midsommar are just masterpieces. I love Midsommar, very creepy movie. Um, a movie that comes out of the world of, uh, um, uh, what's it, uh, Frazier's The Golden Bow. Um, very, very similar to The Wicker Man uh, from 1973. Um, a lot going on in this movie, uh, very creepy. Um, one of the things that I, I tell people about it and they seem kind of surprised by this, but then when I start explaining it, they pick up on it. Um, dark remake of the Wizard of Oz, um, where clearly Danny is the Dorothy character um, who has her not, you know, gnosis at the end of the movie, where in Dorothy's case, she learns there's no place like home. In Midsommar, Danny joins the death cult. And of course, both have the three travelers. And if you pay attention to it, the three friends of Danny are like negative versions of the Tin Man, Scarecrow, and uh, uh, the Lion. Um, if you pay oh. real close attention to it, so um, yeah, it, you know when, when you and, and if you pay attention also, when at the very beginning of it, when they're at the party, um, there's little scarecrows all over the place, um, and the one character actually winds up as a scarecrow. Remember, he winds up stuck with straw. Yeah, uh, yeah. So so when you watch it, keep the Wizard of Oz in the back of your head. Um, one, one of the things that's also very unique, I won't have time to get into it, but uh, if, if you watch the movie and you like numbers, and again, this is what we were talk, kind of hinting at earlier, is uh, pay attention to the number nine, uh, because uh, in Midsommar, the number nine literally blankets it. Um, and the reason for that is because nine is a critical number within Norse mythology. In fact, it's the critical number. Um, so when you watch Midsommar, keep, keep your eyes and ears peeled for the number nine. Hmm. Cool. And, and obviously the director put that stuff in there. Oh, like, no doubt. I, it's yeah, no it's doubt. cool and fun. Yeah. Yeah. Aster, um, Aster is an expert at this. Midsommar is overloaded with stuff. And so is Hereditary. I haven't seen his latest movie. I think it's called Bo is Afraid. I've not seen that. But Hereditary and Midsommar, masterpieces, overloaded with stuff. Both of them. Yeah, I gotta check out Hereditary. I don't think I've seen that one. Oh, um, if, you, if you like Midsommar, watch Hereditary. You'll love it. Okay, cool. Uh, what about the bear at the end? Yeah, I, I get in, I get into that in uh, in in the movie book. Um, you know, it's off the top of my head. I can't remember, but the bear was symbolic um, in Norse mythology and how he winds up in it. It's escaping me off the top of my head, but okay. there, I, there was a reason for that. Well, that's good. Uh, this gives us a reason to... So, guys, we're going to have to go buy Robert's book to find out what the deal is with the bear. So yeah, go buy his book. I, I could pull the book up. I could pull it up, but it would take me a no, little bit. No, no, no. Just, but, but, just but show but us it, the it cover. Is in there. Show us the book cover if you have it handy there. Uh, yeah, which, have do you know up. which one it is? Or I it's can pull it, it up after. It's in Cinema Symbolism 3. three Midsom okay. Mid Midsommar's in part three. So, so the bear... I mean, th th that movie... I'll, I'll just say this: that movie is highly complex because you know, you know, it's it's one of those movies that's very similar to The Wizard of Oz because you have the occult symbolism in it. Um, you know, you know, you have the story, then you have the occult symbolism, you know, relating to the number nine. I mean, you have all the sun worship, the Wicker Man stuff going on. But then the other thing in that movie that makes it difficult is the runes. Um, the you know, you know, what is it? The elder Futhark and the younger Futhark, I think they're called. Yeah, yeah. Um, if if you pay, it, it, the runes have meaning. Um, right. So when you see the runes in this thing, um, you know that's something else you got to dissect because they're there for a reason also. And if you haven't seen Hereditary, um, I won't blow it for you. I won't spoil it. But if you watch Midsommar, you'll remember sort of the murals on the walls. Uh, you know the Harga cult. Um, you'll find that in, in 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 Hereditary with these little panoramic displays that the mother's creating. They kind of run parallel with the uh, murals in, in, in the Haga death cult. Uh, so so check that out the next time you uh, watch it. Okay, cool. So um, I think we got about 10 minutes left. So um, I want to ask you, uh, like you mentioned the occult, and I think that's a really interesting word because like 
the literal meaning is hidden. Yes. Right. Um, but uh, you know, we live in a in a society that has a very strong Christian influence, and um, especially with my background, I was in the church for many years, and so for for many of us, that word has distinctly evil uh, connotations, and like. I guess, what's your opinion on that? Like, how do you, um, what do you think about uh, the word and, and how that sort of ties in with the things that you're interested in? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, 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 it can be both positive and negative. I mean, it can have, you know, it can just mean hidden, um, you know, you know, esoteric or arcane. Um, but certainly, you know, it, it can carry a, a negative connotation and it can be very dark. I mean, part of the occult is certainly black magic and witchcraft. Um, but part of the occult is also, you know, white magic and, you know, uh, you know, things like that. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it just depends on, it's like anything, it's like anything else with a symbol. I mean, a symbol can be positive. It can be negative. It has to just do with the creator's intent. Um, and it's sort of the same way with the occult. Um, it just has to do with the way the person wants to use it. I mean, it can be, you know, positive. It, it can be used just to hide stuff. Um, I mean, I, I would say that, in my books, um, you know, they, they, they could, you know, be considered a cult because I hide little things in them from time to time, little clues, um, little codes here and there. I mean, that could be, you know, considered the occult. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's both. I mean, it can be both or neither or a combination of thereof. So, right. you know, I mean, I, I, it's a word I don't have a problem with. It's a word that pops up all over my books. Yeah. Um, but, but, you know, I mean, you, you could, you know, th th there are aspects of, Freemasonry, you know, that you could say are a cult. Um, I mean, you, you know, a, a, a critic will say, oh, it's, you know, this, that or the other. But you could say, no, it's just the ritual is hiding things. Um, you know, it's, it's hiding hidden meanings. Um, right. I mean, even when you go through the ritual, you are often told, you know, the ritual you went, you just went through is an allegory. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means it, it has other meanings. Well, what are those other meanings? Well, they're hidden, you know, so, i.e. they're a cult. Um, the one, the one thing I will say about the word, and I'm leaning, leaving it at this, is um, in this country especially, um, there is a, a, a and I, I certainly am not perfect, um, and certainly I make mistakes, and no, nobody's perfect. I don't want to sound like I'm, you know, speaking, you know, on a soapbox here or anything, but there is a, a, a tendency in this country that to, to um, when they use the word, they want to turn it into a verb. Um, or something like like occulted a, a history, um, you know, or or something like that, um, and that that is technically wrong. Um, uh, the, the the word occulted actually means to block. Um, it's it's like so. For example, you would say um, there was a traffic accident, you know, and a, a tractor trailer overturned and and occulted the the highway or something like that. That's technically the correct use of it. Um, people use it to mean like, you know, our occulted history, meaning like, you know, history that has, hasn't been told to us. Technically, they're not using that, right? It's one of my little pet peeves. Um, mm -hmm. But again, I don't fault anyone for it. But it's a word in this country that you see it all the time. And um, there's actually book titles with it. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's the right word they're using. But like I said, nobody's perfect. Oh, that's fair. Um, so well, it isn't, wouldn't you say that it's true that um, in the writings of, well, I was going to say the writings of Jesus, but uh, Jesus didn't actually write any of the stuff that we have. Um, but in the Gospels, um, Jesus says a lot of stuff that is very hidden. So Jesus' oh, sure. sayings are purely occultish, occultic. Yes. yes. Um, and so he's got, there's hidden information. Um, and also hidden power because he, t he does healing. He does, he has, uh, magical powers in many ways. He can oh, walk on water. Uh, he can disappear in a crowd. And so to me, these are, uh, this is indication that, that, uh, Jesus is, has both hidden, um, hidden meaning, hidden information, as well as hidden power. And so. Yeah, I, I totally I, uh, agree. Yeah, no, I mean. If, if I mean, I, th I think it's in Matthew where, you know, if if, G if if Jesus wasn't speaking in riddles, he wasn't speaking or something yeah. like that. And yeah, I mean, absolutely. And if you read if you read the Gnostic texts, 
um, you know, you know, the, these secret gospels. I mean, it's, it's a lot of Gnostic teachings. And, and, you know, it was the sort of thing was, you know, Jesus had these um, teachings that were, um, you know, for, for the masses. But then he had secret teachings that he told his disciples. Um, and you get like the gospel of Mary Magdalene, the gospel of Judas, um, you know, the, the gospel of truth, where right. Jesus had these secret teachings um, that, you know, he only passed on to the select few. I mean, and a lot of these relate to Hebrew Kabbalah. Um, and, uh, the, the, you know, they, they call it in, in Christianity, this is Kabbalah spelled with the letter C instead of the letter K. Um, and, 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 and you run, you, you have these parallels where, you know, in Kabbalah, you have the Sephirot. Um, in, 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 in Christianity, these things are called the celestial hierarchies. So, yeah, I mean, you, you have these, these mystical doctrines um, running completely parallel. A lot of people denounce this stuff. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I'll read a book on conspiracy, you know, where Kabbalah is evil. You know, this is all evil. I mean, it's like, dude, I mean, you know, Kabbalah is, you know, allegedly comes from the God of Abraham, which, you know, the people who created the New Testament, that's the same God that Jesus is. Now, we can debate that if it's the same God or not. But, you know, I mean, I mean, how, how in any way is this evil? I mean, now it could it be used for evil purposes. Of course, everything could be. Um, right. But, you know, I mean, I, I you know, oh, Kabbalah is evil and, and this, that and the other. Well, you know, I mean, it, 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 it comes from the God of Abraham. So, I mean, if if it's evil, then the God of Abraham is evil. I mean, now yeah. some people will tell you that's the case. Some that's people right. will tell you that's the demiurge or something like that. Right. But, um, you know, you, you will find these Kabbalistic doctrines um, in Christianity. They're called the celestial hierarchies. They're in Islam. Um, Raymond Lully, who was the, you know, head sort of Muslim mystic. Um, he called these things the dignities of God. So you you find these parallels all in the Abrahamic faiths. And uh, yeah, is it is it mystical? Sure, but just because it's mystical, don't don't ascribe evil to mysticism. That's a mistake, in my opinion. You know what? That is a perfect way to end the show, and uh, and so I'm going to wrap that up. Don't say that again. Don't ascribe evil to mysticism. Correct. Yeah. And and I think that that's kind of tr true with the whole Gnostic thing is that, um, you know, part of Gnosticism is understanding this hidden truth, but there's also a part that is embracing the truth that we do not know. I agree. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, let's leave it at that. So everyone, let us embrace the truth that we do not know. Thank you, Robert. Um, it was, again, a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to put uh, right across our faces right now, I'm going to put your books. So everybody go check out these books. Um, again, the one that we were talking about with uh, with Mids Midsomar uh, was uh, number three. Correct. Of the, uh, what's the name of the series again? Cinema, Cinema Symbolism. Symbolism. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, very cool. Thank you for joining us. And we will talk to you again. Goodbye.